Hey everybody, it's MJ here Just Plain Fun, and today we're going to do a video on hand plane buying, what to look for, and what to avoid. So in a way, it's kind of a beginner's guide to buying hand planes, but hopefully even the folks that are not beginners, who knows, maybe they'll get something out of it too, maybe the, the, the novices among us. So the first thing I want to do is I want to recommend picking up a copy of the Anarchist Tool Chest by Chris Schwartz. I feel like everybody... Every woodworker should read this book, even if you don't heed everything in it as far as Chris Schwartz's advice or guides, guidelines. You know, even if you don't follow them all, it's still great stuff. It's just good information to have. The next step, what I want to recommend that everybody does is ask yourself, what do you want to do? Do you want to be primarily a woodworker and you want to fill out your fill up your tool chest with quality tools and be able to do most things? Do you want to build your collection slowly? Do you want to collect? Do you want to use? Do you want to sell, i.e. flip, you know, restore and or just flip hand planes? Do you want to do some of all of the above? And if you do want to do all of the above or you find yourself doing all of the above, then next I would ask the question, what do you want to do most? You know, what really speaks to you and where do you want to spend your time? And I know I'm getting kind of philosophical on you here, but you know, these are worthwhile questions to ask because you can very easily find yourself going astray and find yourself doing, spending your time doing things that you didn't necessarily set out to do. So, you know, again, collect, use, sell, flip, restore, all of the above. What do you want to do most? And look, it's okay to lie to yourself and say you're not going to collect. And we all know the truth because, you know, Six months from now, lo and behold, you're building a collection and, and you don't even know how it happened. But without further ado, here's my main takeaway from this entire video. If you remember nothing else, or even if you just listen to this and then shut it off, doesn't matter. The most important thing to remember, when you're buying hand planes, especially when you're starting out, buy the best hand plane that you can afford. So whatever your budget will allow, the best hand plane that you can afford, that's the one that you should buy. And of course, the next obvious question after a statement like that is, well, MJ, I want to buy the best hand plane that I can buy. Okay, so what is it? What is the best hand plane that money can buy? And I can tell you that in my humble opinion, it is not necessarily sitting on this bench, at least not on camera view. There's one that's real close, but I'm glad you asked because that is exactly what we're going to cover. And before I go any further, let me just say that everything, this is, you know, this is just my opinion. And I'm not an expert by any stretch of the imagination. It's just my opinion. And so you got to take it with a grain of salt. So what you see on the bench now is a very, very oversimplified version of the evolution of hand planes. So, and I'm sure 90% of you already know this, but many, many moons ago, all wood base wedge no chip breaker you know a tote very similar to what we see now may or may not have had a front knob but you know this this is an overly simplified you know going all the way back to what the romans had hand planes of a similar nature but it was all wood and then of course your iron and then in 1867 and really before that if you read p tampia roger k smith talks about it but in 1867 you know, along comes Leonard Bailey. This is an actual type one body and frog, a type two lever cap there. But 1867, Leonard Bailey comes along and then, and, and puts out this, you know, all metal plane. And of course, the guys that were used to wooden bodied planes didn't necessarily grasp onto the metal plane with all its bells and whistles. And so we had the transitional plane which is this guy right here. So you've got the adjustment mechanisms that are featured on a metal plane, but you've still got the wood base or the wood body. And so these two kind of coexisted for a while, the metal planes and then the transitionals coexisted. And, and of course, you know, the wooden planes are still out there too for those uh, old timers that like to stick with the old way of doing things. But then the planes evolved. And of course I'm using, you know, Stanley as an example. And there were many, many manufacturers. I'm gonna talk about some of those in this video but you know of course i'm a type 11 guy so this to me is kind of the the pinnacle of stanley's development right here this this 
is the plane, at least in my humble opinion. But of course, don't take my word for it. And then you have the higher evolution of the species. You have the bedrocks, which are Stanley's premier line. And then for a more contemporary plane, you have the Lee Nielsen, which this is a Lee Nielsen number seven. And we'll talk more about that. But I'm setting the stage here for answering that question of what is the best plane? And of course, whenever you bring up the topic of what is the best plane, naturally, you know, folks are going to ask, well, what is the best plane for what? What is the best plane for, for smoothing? What's the best specialty plane? You know, we're talking strictly bench planes. And remember, this is a beginner's guide. And so this is really geared more toward the guy or gal who is, you know, maybe buying their first real hand plane. You know, this is the kind of thing that I wish I had been able to watch a video like this when I first started out. And maybe it was out there and I just didn't know it. But the best plane that you can afford, that's the plane that you're going for. And if you want to try your hand at restoration, hey, that's great. Then buy one, you know, yard sale, flea market, estate sale, whatever. And, you know, put your spin out with restoration. If you want to start out with something solid that's already ready to go, there are a lot of options out there. If you've got the money, you've got the disposable income, you know, invest in a Lee Nielsen. But here's my thought process. When Thomas Lee Nielsen determined or decided that he was going to make hand planes a contemporary version of the old vintage planes he had many many choices of styles and options to choose from and what did he choose he chose the bedrock style the lee nielsen planes are patterned off of the bedrock pattern so that should tell you that bedrock is arguably the best option is one of the best options. Otherwise, Lee Nielsen wouldn't have modeled his plane after it. Wood River did the exact same thing. They modeled their plane after the bedrock design. So it's got a classic look. It's got a classic feel. It's timeless. Lee Nielsen, you know, if you've got the money. Of course, right now, while this video is being filmed, we're in the middle of a global pandemic. And so you can't get a Lee Nielsen, or at least can't buy one new. And you're gonna pay a ton on eBay, but that also speaks to their quality because what other tool do you know of that actually appreciates in value after it's made? You could buy one from Lee Nielsen when they are in stock and then turn around and flip it on eBay and sometimes make more money, but that's neither here nor there. So now we got to break it down and look at, okay, why was it, you know, why was the bedrock the best and why did Lee Nielsen and Wood River choose to copy those? That's where we want to qualify. I want to qualify the claim that Bedrock is the best. And this is why, you know, and explain why I think Lee Nielsen copied it. But before we get to that, before we get to talking about why Lee Nielsen is the best, why Bedrock is the best. First, let's go ahead and cover what not to buy. Let's talk about what to avoid when you're out there looking for your first hand plane. So what to avoid this garbage right here if you see something that's got this type this style of adjuster for adjusting the blade on a hand plane it's fine for a spoke shave for a hand plane not so much if you see that avoid it like the plague you know like you see from the harbor freight design and you know plastic handles this thing if you were a the highly skilled hand tool you know hand plane user you know maybe you could tune that and you could get some fine shavings but you know, again, we're geared towards beginners here and you don't want that to be your first plane. It's just going to result in frustration. This is another one. When you see this design right here in the bed, that's your telltale sign to avoid run. When you see that ugly tote or handle run, when you see this particular tab for adjusting your iron, stay away, you know, and me personally, I'm not even a fan of, I'm not a fan of the, the split yoke. But, you know, if you like it, that's cool. But when you see the maroon body on a bench plane, as a general rule, that is one to consider avoiding. But definitely when it has this in the bed, you want to avoid that, that whole C578 or whatever that thing is. There's not a week that goes by on the big hand plane site on Facebook, not my group, not just plain fun, but the big hand plane restoration collecting using group. It's not a week that goes by that somebody doesn't post one of these either maroon from the Cordovan period or one of these, these blue ones, same thing. 
and ask, hey, what did I find? You know, what have I got? It's it's junk. Just avoid these. The only thing these have going for them is that they've got some, some weight to them. So, you know, if you like a weighty plane, that's okay. But everything else that takes away from it just makes it not even worth having. Just all this junk. The frog seat, which I'm going to talk more about later. The lateral adjust lever, the split yoke, the plastic handles. It's all just junk it's all you know to be avoided you know maybe make a scrub plane out of it but honestly there's so many other better options this handle this tote is not even ergonomically comfortable you know just just junk and then another one of course the the par plus or pair plus or however that's pronounced the pextos these are all planes to avoid you can usually tell it's not a hard and fast rule, but you can usually tell non rosewood, you know, ugly style, the, the stamped steel frog. See that is detachable. It's just, it's, oh, it's awful. You know, the short little uh, lever cap there, you know, just absolute garbage. And these are to be avoided. And I apologize in advance to anybody who is a fan of Pextos or the par plus this is a classic pexto right here and it is just absolute junk you can tell just by looking at it, it's all chintzy design chintzy parts and i mean look at this look at this lever cap it's just i mean what is that that's just it's garbage this thing is going to lead to nothing but disappointment and i shouldn't probably trash it anymore uh but some other things to look out for when you're out there shopping at a, you know, garage sale, yard sale, estate sale, etc. You want to look out for things like this. Is this plane still functional with that? Yes, absolutely. If you watch Wood by Wright, he's got plenty in his arsenal and his lineup that have, you know, chips out of them. Nothing wrong with that. It'll still function. But as far as collectability goes, this goes back to that question of asking yourself, are you going to be a collector? Are you may be a user. Are you going to be both not collectible once it has the chip and then another one is this these cracks which are very common you know right usually coming from the edge of the mouth there on either one or both sides and it has to do with tightening hardware too tight up on the top by the way but you definitely want to watch out for that you might still buy it for a parts plane and then use the part somewhere else but you know something to look out for when you're out and about and you can even take a razor blade with you so if you find one that's really rusted you know you ask the person that's selling it of course and if they're okay with it you can scrape it off and see if it's correct you might even be able to use that as a negotiating point to you know try to get a better price this one looks really nice doesn't look half bad right but unfortunately it's got that little crack there so chances are somebody probably put that upside down in a vice you know maybe lapping the bottom you know the opposite of the normal way or something but they probably put it upside down in a vice squeeze those cheeks together and unfortunately crack that that's the most likely culprit there but again things to look out for cracks in the casting you know can be here here you know of course a straight up break and it might be brazed and then you know all along the cheeks so now we've talked about all the things that you want to avoid so now let's talk about what are you looking for what makes a hand plane a good hand plane you know what are the what are the qualities so these are the things to consider we're lo looking at adjustment mechanisms so how quickly effectively simply can i adjust the depth of my cut you know how easily can i adjust the frog mechanism you know how easily can i move it forward and aft what about my blade lateral movement or lateral adjustment how efficiently and how well can I move and how, how, how much can I fine tune my blade adjustment from left to right. And then ergonomics. So especially in terms of the furniture, how comfortable is the tote and the knob? How comfortable are they in my hand? Um, you know, looking at cheap features or chintzy features versus quality where you can tell that the manufacturer had quality in mind and then thickness of the iron this is a pretty important one and this is the one area where stanley kind of i hate to say it at least the vintage planes is where stanley kind of lacks a little bit 
And then frog placement. This is a big one. You know, how is the frog embedded into the plane? Like how is it set? And of course that can impact how easily it can be moved. So we're going to talk about all those things and I'm going to break it down. So we're going to take a, a bottom line up front approach here and just go ahead and run down the list real quick. As far as lateral adjustment lever goes, lateral adjust movement, you want this wheel right here as opposed to any kind of tab like this if you can avoid it. So because this wheel is arguably the best design that there is for lateral adjustment. For the frog, you want one that sits down in the bed and I'll go into more detail on this, but you want one that actually makes contact, the leading edge of the frog makes contact with the, the bed of the plane. And then of course, bedrock and the VBMs and, and the keen cutters, they had a superior design on that, which I'll go into more detail on as well. And then for your blade depth, you know, there's a lot of options out there, but at least in my opinion, a solid yoke versus the split yoke and then just brass. And, and if you like the, the smaller brass, the little one inch versus the inch and a quarter, I mean, that's just a matter of personal preference, but you want that to turn nice and easily and you want to be able to make fine adjustments there. And I talked about in another video, I talked about backlash, so I won't go into a bunch of detail on that. But so we talked about lateral adjust. We talked about blade depth adjustment we talked about the frog as far as the bed and seat in there and then this frog adjustment which showed up in the type 10s on the stanley the standard stanley bench planes that frog adjustment is helpful for being able to make fine adjustments to be able to move your frog forward and aft by you know a 30 second at a time or so and then the ergonomics of course if you've used a stanley plane or if you've seen a stanley plane you borrowed one you know used one at a friend's house whatever you know, the ergonomically, and again, my opinion, the Stanley, you know, the Rosewood specifically, you know, this furniture is arguably the best. And then I'm a, I'm a low knob guy. And so, you know, again, personal preference, if you like a high knob better, then so be it. But bottom line up front, those are the features that you're looking for, at least in my humble opinion. And you can find most maybe even all those features in another brand other than Stanley. But of course I'm going to, you know, favor Stanley because that's just, that's my, that's my jam. So now that we got all that out of the way, we can break it down and talk about some of these individual features. And then, you know, a little bit about branding manufacturers and a little bit about, you know, where you can find what. So just starting off this right here, and this is a little identification for you as well. That right there is a Sargent design right there. When you see that, that tells you that that's Sargent. Sargent also made planes for Craftsman and also Fulton. And so you might see that and you just know that that's Sargent made, but they made them and it may have been a Sargent, it may have been a Fulton, it may have been a Craftsman. You gotta look for other hints there to go along with that. And speaking of manufacturers making planes for other for other brands, um, Keen Cutter. So this is a K4 right here. This is actually a Bedrock, a Stanley Bedrock Frog. And as you can see, these are so identical. They're so, you know, you can't even say similar. They're identical because the Keen Cutter, this style, the K series was actually made by Stanley, you know, and it was made to mirror the Bedrock. So you can actually put a Bedrock Frog on a keen cutter on a K4 or a K5 in a pinch if you had to, because they're identical. But this bed right here, you have 100, well, you have nearly 100%, we'll call it 100% solid contact between the entire bottom of the frog and the bed. So you're not gonna have to worry about getting, you know, a bunch of shavings up underneath that. You're gonna have solid placement. And when you move that frog forward and aft, you know that you're gonna maintain that solid placement and so that is a superior design that's why lee nielsen copied it this is a who drew a blank there this is a vaughn and bushnell right here so and again same design if i pulled this frog off you would see that that has the same solid base that that frog sits on and so if you can't afford a bedrock 
then you know maybe go for the king cutter looking specifically for the k4 or k5 series they're usually cheaper than a bedrock if you can't afford those but you can find one you know get yourself a vaughn and bushnell you're still going to hit or you're going to get that same feature and then of course if you can't afford it and if you can find it then i do highly recommend getting a bedrock i don't use these all the time this is the only bedrock that i keep which is my 604 and a half but the bedrocks are you know it's a it's a great design and that frog seat is arguably the best and then of course you know i'm always going to keep coming back to the stanley's and this one right here specifically remember i talked about the leading edge of the frog coming in contact with the bed of the plane so that you don't have the what's called the cantilever design and in case you're not familiar with what i'm talking about i'm a handy dandy training aid right here and if you look right there when that frog is seated in the bed you can see that there's an actual opening you could slip you know two three sheets of paper in between there and so you don't have positive contact with that leading edge with the bed and this is why you know me personally will why i don't like the older stanley's as much you know your type five through eight i mean really you know one through eight but who uses a one through four as a regular user so but it has that cantilever design meaning that the leading edge of the frog is actually sitting out over top and you will get shavings up underneath there and i'm not saying that that will necessarily affect performance or negatively impact performance right away but it does build up over time and it is kind of a pain and then this right here is a little side profile of what the one looks like when it's actually made in contact but you you can pretty well imagine that but you can see and this is obviously you know this is a dunlap which is something that is you know what miller's falls made and we'll talk more about that later but that's a little done that and so for the stanley's it's your type nines is where you had the leading edge of the frog this one of course the type 11 which type nines is where they went away from the cantilever frog and started making contact with the leading edge there so these are all things to consider when you're looking at buying your first plane and so for me collectability wise if you want to collect and use then you know you're looking for something that's affordable you're looking for something that's going to be easy to find parts for you're looking for something that's not going to get you laughed out of the place when you show up just kidding uh so you're looking for a stanley you're looking for that type 10 you know really type 9 is okay too but type 10 because you got the frog adjustment screw but type 10 through type 15 are going to be your most collectible and then your type 10 through your type 19 are going to be you know collectible slash great users and so you know you can pick up either a stanley number four or stanley number five which that's what i recommend that anybody who's just getting into hand planes that's what i recommend looking for is either a four or five basically whichever one you can find first in an affordable price that's what you want to start with if you got a choice between the two i recommend going with the number five but stanley number five between type 10 and type 19 you really can't go wrong with any of those for a first plane so now let's talk more about that lateral adjust remember i already said that this right here this wheel right there is the in my opinion is the superior design right there for your lateral adjust and this is what you want to try to avoid is that little tab if you can just because it's not consistent for engaging with your blade that's why they went away you know that's why most manufacturers went away from that it it's obviously more expensive to produce this but you know when companies are trying to save money that's when they would go with a cheaper design that right there is specific to the type 5 that's the only time that you'll see that as a type 5 and this does work but it's just not my personal preference and plus the type 5s i mean they're older and they're not the best users anyway but you know they'll get you by but there's another version of that tab you hear people throw around the term department store brand or department store you know quality that's what you're talking about right here and this is a two-tone also made by stanley but you know you can see cheap chintzy frog you can see it's a cantilever design so you got the space underneath there you got that that you know cheapo lateral adjust feature and then you know again it's not just stanley that had this you know here is a miller's falls here's a number eight right here and this one had the same design now i'm not crazy about that split yoke you know that's not my favorite thing but as far as lateral adjust goes 
you know, that's looking, looking pretty good right there. So you got lots of options out there, but I'm going to keep going back because naturally I'm a Stanley guy. So I'm going to keep favoring Stanley. As far as depth of your cut goes, you know, this is, you know, for the standard bench planes, this is what you're going to see in a lot of things. It doesn't matter whether it's department store brand or department store quality there, or if you're talking about the old Vaughn and Bushnell, or if you're talking about the Bedrock, you know, they're all following that, that same basic design because it works. And that's what we do. You know, we stick with what works, right? But I would be remiss if I didn't bring up the fact that there are other styles out there for depth adjustment. So this is a standard rule plane right here, you know, brand. And this one's obviously got a very different design for adjusting the depth of your blade. So if you happen to be lucky enough to come across one of these, by all means, pick it up. And even if you don't end up making a user out of it, there's plenty of collectors that will happily take it off your hands. And then you can use that money to go buy, you know, a nice Stanley plane for yourself. Or, you know, here's, a, you know, Bailey Victor right here. And of course he had his own design as well, which is very cool as far as, you know, blade depth adjustment. So if you happen to be, you know, ballsy enough to use one of those for a user, then you can certainly do that. And then here is one from the Bailey Tool Company right here. And once again, we have another design right here or adjuster for adjusting the depth of the cut. So lots of different designs out there and it's certainly not limited to just what you see on my bench. You know, pick up a copy of Patent trans, patented transitional and metallic planes in America, AKA P Tampia, and you will see countless designs in there of different patents that were tried and different things, but we're, we're keeping it simple. We're staying on task here, or at least we're trying to, and we're talking primarily about, you know, your Stanley's, your Miller's Falls, your sergeants, you know, those are the ones, especially the older sergeants, those are the ones that you're gonna wanna be looking for to make users out of them. All right, so now let's talk about thickness of the iron because this is this is an important one. I'm not going to get into talking about, you know, O2 versus A2 steel and all that kind of stuff because that's that's you can go watch James Wright and, you know, on Wood by Wright and watch his breakdown of, you know, which blades are superior. But I'm just talking just blade thickness in general. So remember, I claimed that bedrocks are the best planes which I still think they are, but you know, this is an original Stanley iron. You can see it's coming in at 0 0.07, just under 0 0.08. So that's what we got there. And then of course we know Lee Nielsen, and I'm not even gonna mic it cause you can tell by looking at it, but we know Lee Nielsen took all the best features of the bedrock and then they put a nice thick iron in there. So that alone should tell you that a thicker iron is gonna be superior. But you know, the one thing that Sargent really got right and the only thing that they did better than Stanley, in my humble opinion, is, you know, they went with a thicker iron. So this one right here, this is actually a Fulton, but of course it's Sargent made. And even though it's not the full thickness on some of the other ones, like I'm about to show you, it's still, you know, it's already thicker than the Stanley. And remember, that's just a Fulton. And really, you know, you could take a Fulton iron or a Sargent iron, you could put it in a Stanley. You might go to hand plane, you know, Hades, but you could do it. But this one right here is another sergeant iron right here. This one is out of, you know, a uh, number seven size and, you know, sergeant there. And again, you know, quite a bit thicker. You can see the 0.11 there on that. And then there's some other brands out there as far as the vintage ones go, like the, you know, Revenant there. <laughs> And then that's another sergeant, which is kind of redundant to show you that one. But the Revenant, you can see, has got a nice thick iron right there. And then for aftermarket irons, of course, you can go out and buy yourself a Hawk. And the great thing about Hawk is you can run it with either the original chip breaker, like what was in the plane originally, and then that's not going to be as thick overall. Or you can get the actual Hawk chip breaker as well. And then you're going to be looking at a lot thicker, you know, you may get less chatter, but you're gonna be looking at a thicker overall iron there. And so you're potentially gonna be looking at opening up the mouth on your vintage plane, making the mouth wider in order to accept that, that wider 
or that thicker, excuse me, that thicker iron. And so thickness of the iron without going into too much detail, you know, it's going to might take a little bit longer to sharpen, but it's going to hold the edge potentially longer and it's going to be potentially less chatter. Again, the actual employment of it, you know, that's a video for another day. But when you're looking for a plane, especially your, your first, you know, starting out plane, it's something to consider. And if you do want to go with a vintage Stanley, hey, you know, go for it. And then if you want to get top performance out of it, then by all means, go out and get yourself a Hawk or get yourself a vintage iron from another company that is thicker. So this isn't even fair, but it's pop quiz time. It's not fair because I didn't even warn y'all in advance. So you're at a flea market and you see these five, these are all number four size planes. And you see these five planes in front of you and which one are you gonna buy? So now it's time to apply the things that we talked about in the video. So first things first, and remember I'm a parts guy. I make money by selling you parts. First things first, we're gonna get rid of this one right here because it's not complete. Do not buy an incomplete plane unless you either have the parts at home, you uh, you know are buying it because it's a collector. You're buying it because you like, or, you know, it's collectible. You you're buying it because you like the challenge. But if in terms of money, in terms of saving money, do not buy an incomplete plane because you're going to spend more money than what the plane is worth by the time you buy a serviceable tote to go on here, and then an iron and a cap iron or an iron chip breaker and a lever cap, especially if you want to get all original stuff. So don't buy an incomplete plane unless you know what you're doing. And then again, applying what we talked about. This one's non rosewood furniture and it's a Dunlap. In this case, it's made, you know, by probably Miller's Falls is what I'm thinking based on the lateral there. And the, you know, this, this is only 15 bucks. 20 bucks, something like that. If you want to buy it, hey, you know, if the, and especially if this is the best plane that you can afford, by all means, buy this plane. You know, it's got the nice wheel for the adjuster there. Your frog's making contact. It's got, you know, it's a decent iron in there. This is a decent plane and will make a decent user. And so if this is what you can afford, by all means, buy it. But let's say that your budget is $50, then we're going to put this one aside because you can afford a better plane. So here's another non Stanley and this one right here, the handle on it has been repaired. This is Rosewood, but the handle has been repaired with some high speed. Well, maybe it's not high speed, but it's been repaired with some electrical tape. So this one's got, you know, a lot of our bells and whistles because this Ward's master was actually made by Stanley. So it's got the Rosewood, it's got the frog adjustment. It's got, you know, all the features that a Stanley, a later Stanley would have, you know, this OG style frog. And then the twisted lateral is what tells us that it's not an actual Stanley. Well, aside from the lever cap. But if you had a Stanley lever cap, which is pretty common, then the twisted lateral would tell you that it's not a true Stanley. But because of that rosewood tote, and then because it's a Ward's Master, you know, you're probably going to pass on this one. You know, they're, they probably got this one priced at 20 bucks. Saw one sell on the Can I Have It page last weekend for, I think, 25 or something like that and the tote was intact. So now we're down to these two planes right here. These are both Stanleys. They're both number fours. And this is really what I want y'all to take away from this because, you know, let's say this one is priced at $40 and this one's priced at 50 or 55 or something like that. And your budget was, was 50, that one's 55. So of course we're gonna be giving you an opportunity to go over budget, to go plead with a wife and explain why you need to spend more. So, as you can see, the furniture on this one is jacked. And if you haven't looked for an original Rosewood tote lately, let me just let you know they're they're about, you know, $35, $40 for an original intact Rosewood tote. So, and then this hand, or excuse me, the knob here is, is all torn up as well. So you're gonna save money because remember we said this one's priced at whatever, $35, $40, like I said, 40. And, you know, a lot of the things on it are the same as this other plane. So you're going to think, oh, this is a better deal because I'm going to save money. Well, you're not going to save money unless you're going to go home and repair that tote yourself. And then you're putting more time into it. But given the opportunity, you know, buy a solid plane. Buy one that doesn't necessarily need parts. Buy one that you can really look at it and verify that there's no cracks 
you know, if you can find one. Now, if you find one for five bucks or 10 bucks or something, then it's worth taking a chance on, then by all means, because then you can still come out ahead even if you have to buy a part or two. But, you know, these are all things to consider. And this is the advantage of buying a plane from, say, a guy like me or one of the many other folks out there, especially on Facebook, that sell planes. We've already been through, you know, looked at the entire plane, looked it over, and we've already replaced all the bad parts on it. So yeah, you're gonna have a, a higher initial investment, but you know you're gonna get something that even if it's in as found condition, it's at least been cleaned up. And so, you know, a plane like that, you know, probably 55 bucks for a decent little number four, you know, probably what, a type 16 or a type 19, excuse me. So type 19, um, so yeah, that's your pop quiz. So to recap, buy the best plane that you can afford. Buy a Stanley if you can. Obviously, that's a biased opinion on my part. So if you want to branch out, you want to get a, a Winchester, a Keen Cutter, a Miller's Falls, a Sergeant, by all means, you know, pick up one of those brands. But I highly recommend that you get a Stanley. There's a reason why they were king for so long. There's a reason why they've been around and are still around to this day, whereas a lot of those other companies folded or were bought out by Stanley. But this plane right here was actually the first plane, the first collectible plane of any real value that I bought. I got it at an estate sale. And as much as I hate to admit it, it is a number six. But, and it, of course, is a Type 11. But this is what started my road down the Type 11s and specifically the corrugated soles. Because, again, it was the first one that I ever got that was of any kind of significant value. I've done almost nothing to it. Like I put like a replacement iron in it and then knocked off the top layer of rust. And I haven't even done anything with this tote yet. It's still got the, the screwed repair to put the horn back on. But maybe someday I'll do it. But I don't use my six a whole lot. And now I'm just battling. So let me shut up. And I hope you got something out of this. By all means, if you have opinions, if you want to refute anything that I claimed, by all means, you know, hit me up either on here on YouTube or facebook just plain fun the parts division and if you're one of the you know 100 people or 500 people that watch these videos and you haven't subscribed yet please go ahead and do so still marching toward that thousand subscriber mark and if you like this content please feel free to share it with a friend and encourage them to watch it too but thank you for watching i appreciate it